think that's all from me. Happy holiday for most of us and enjoy the course. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Thank you, Yuski, for the welcoming speech. Now we are going straight to our main event. Before that, it is better for us to have a prayer for sleep. Pray with our own beliefs. Pray begin. Pray finish. Now we continue to our schedule. To Dave, the time is yours. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aleph and Ahmed. I appreciate your your kindness and the warmth of your greeting. It's it's a pleasure to to be here. It's a pleasure to virtually. Uh, meet you all, <laughs> to see you all. Thank you. I should say assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa salan. I haven't said that in a long time, but anyway, I, I, I truly mean it. It's great, great to see you all. Let me just uh, start the show here if I could. Um, and what I'll try to do is share screen. So please bear with me if... Uh, Can you see my screen? Is that coming across okay? Yes, I can see it. Okay, okay. You see the full screen, not the presenter notes, but the full screen, correct? Yep. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much for that. And I hope everybody can hear me well, right? Uh, is, is the volume okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's great. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, well again, thank you very much for your kindness uh, that you've shown me and invited me to talk about what is really a subject that's near and dear to my heart, uh, and that's res reservoir quality and carbonates. Um, I've subtitled this, this, this conversation, this presentation today, I've subtitled it, as you see here, the good, the bad, and the ugly in reservoir performance. That's kind of the, the interesting thing, the challenging thing, the unique thing about carbonates, I think, in general terms, because on the one hand, you have carbonates can be some of the very best reservoir rocks in the world, and on the other hand, they can be also some of the very worst. That's kind of the dichotomy, and again, the challenge of dealing with, uh, with, with carbonate reservoir quality and the resulting reservoir performance. So, as, as carbonate reservoir geologists, we've got, you know, we've got a, a challenging job ahead of us to try to understand this parameter. Okay, so I will just give you at the start of the presentation, give you sort of a roadmap of, uh, of where I hope to take you today. Uh, I'm sorry, Dave. Uh, for Miss Aprilia Timatina Retnowati, please. <laughs> Should I wait or? Miss uh, Aprilia, please mute your audio. Okay. Okay. Proceed, okay. Dave. I'm sorry. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. No worries. No worries. Um, anyway, as I was saying, just to just to get started with the meat of the presentation, I I wanted to give you sort of a roadmap of where I hope to take you in the next hour or so in our conversation together, in our limited time together. First off, we'll start out and talk about what is reservoir quality, maybe define some terms here, kind of talk specifically about what I mean when I say reservoir quality, and then try to spell out why it's important, why you should care about it. So we'll start with that. Then we'll sort of try to bring this down and talk about carbonates in particular. We'll talk about some of the peculiar things, the distinctive aspects of reservoir quality and carbonates. So we could talk for days on that subject alone, uh, the distinctiveness of carbonates, but I'll, I'll try to just keep that to just uh, five or 10 minutes or so. And then we'll finally get to the last, the, the third bullet point here, which is really the meat of our conversation today. I'll try to present to you two case histories uh, that illustrate some of the challenges, if you will, of understanding and predicting carbonate reservoir quality. And I, I wanted to underline those two words, understanding and predicting, because both are equally important. Um, you know, you have to first off understand what it is that's driving reservoir quality, what's controlling reservoir quality first in order to sort of then do the second step, which is for us that work in the subsurface, probably an even more important point, which is predicting carbonate reservoir quality. 
you can understand what you know. You know what you know. If you've drilled a well, you can understand, you know, how does the reservoir, how does the rock quality vary up and down the well bore? But then what do you do when you go, when your boss asks you to drill another well? Which direction do you go? What specific intervals do you target? So that's when you get into the predicting aspect of it. So both understanding and prediction of carbonate reservoir quality are really important aspects of the challenge, of the, 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 the job that we have in front of us as carbonate reservoir geologists. So let's start out and, and just kind of define some terms be, uh, to begin with. What do I mean? What exactly is reservoir quality? Well, I've sort of blatantly plagiarized uh, from, a, uh, from the AAPG wiki for a definition that I think is really appropriate for us as geologists. Now, beware that if you talk to other folks, uh, reservoir engineers, uh, reservoir geophysicists, they may have a slightly different definition. But for us as geologists, this seems to be a pretty reasonable one. We'll define reservoir quality as, uh, as the quality of the reservoir is defined by its hydrocarbon storage capacity and deliverability. Now again, just to pause at, at that point, storage capacity and deliverability. What do we mean by that? Storage capacity means how much fluid, oil and gas obviously, but sometimes water, how much fluid can the reservoir hold, the storage capacity of the reservoir? Deliverability then speaks to the ability of that reservoir to transmit fluids, to deliver fluids to a reservoir. So both of those are equally important parameters or terms in, ter in, in terms of, of, of understanding reservoir quality. Now storage capacity, typically we parameterize this, we quantify this using porosity and deliverability, we use permeability. So those are the quantitative terms for the purposes of our talk today, of our conversation today, I'll sort of lump both of those together and call them sort of qualitatively, we'll, we'll call that reservoir quality. But when I speak about reservoir quality, just be aware, that's what I mean, porosity and permeability. So why should you care? What's the big deal about reservoir quality? What, what, what is so important about it? Why should you get excited about it? <laughs> Well, you only, unlike what you might hear in the popular media, if you listen to CNN or whatever, you get the impression oftentimes that oil and gas actually occurs in a large underground tank. And it's a pretty easy matter to go and drill it and suck it out, basically. That's often the impression you get from, from listening to the popular media. Unfortunately, reality is not like that at all. In fact, what you, uh, for what you, what you find is that oil and gas actually occurs in the subsurface in holes and rocks, in pores that have a variety of sizes and shapes and degrees of connectedness. Um, and you only have to sort of drive out to an outcrop uh, to see the, the expression of this dramatically exposed. And I'll point to this first photo here in the upper, upper right. This is a road cut of a uh, reservoir analog. This is equivalent to, one of, to uh, producing reservoir in the subsurface in central Saudi Arabia. Now it's exposed for us, so we can actually see what's going on here. So we have the, uh, the advantage of that. But what you can see here is that you can see a number of large holes that sort of cross cut this road cut. Uh, if you look at these things, note the, the figures, the, the, the two people for scale, these are large uh, holes that run basically parallel or horizontal rather uh, across this outcrop and look like they all connect up. These are huge holes. These are cavernous uh, pores that cross cut this reservoir. Think about what this would act like in the subsurface. This would be a huge high flow zone uh, in, in the subsurface if we were to encounter this zone. So this is one type of, of flow unit, if you will, one type of really significant pore or reservoir quality issue that, that you'd want to be aware of in, in terms of addressing reservoir quality. Note that, I don't know if you can make it out in this, in this photograph, but there's also a, a, a sort of a vertical fracture here, solution enlarged at time that cross cuts this. So this is another uh, uh, passageway that fluids can flow, a, a flow unit basically, that fluids can use to access, that we can access the fluids in the, in the reservoir. One of these flow units is stratigraphically concordant, it's parallel to stratigraphy. The other cross cuts is discordant with, with, with stratigraphy, stratigraphically discordant. But at any rate, this is some of the, uh, the, the, the issues. These are some of the issues that we'd want to try to address when we understand reservoir quality. Uh, 
Now, these are the sort of the big picture things, if you will, that you'd see when you first approach a reservoir. This is almost sort of a field scale issue. If we zoom in a little bit and look at, in this case, some cores, sort of hand samples, skies, uh, samples uh, uh, from, from the reservoir, you can see, again, we've got a variety of pores that occur here. Some of them are pretty big, some of them are medium size, and some of them are smaller than we could actually resolve in this, this photograph. So you've got, again, a, a variety of pores that occur in, in a range of sizes and shapes and degrees of connectedness. And then zooming on in even further, looking at it at the microscopic scale, this is a thin section photomicrograph. Uh, and I've injected blue dyed epoxy into this uh, thin section so that you can see the porosity as, as these blue shades here. But again, what you can see here is a variety of pores that occur in this rock and you can see dramatic differences in reservoir quality. And that's kind of the point of this whole harangue here is these variations in reservoir quality at the field scale, at the well scale, and at the micro scale. This kind of represents a big part of the challenge we face in trying to understand uh, subsurface geology. Uh, the variability in these pore sizes and shapes and degrees and connectedness at a variety of link scales. Um, so again, we kind of have our, our job cut out for us in terms of trying to parameterize this, trying to understand these, these variations, uh, understand and predict these variations in reservoir quality. And why should you care about it? Well, if we're successful at that, the benefits can be huge, both to us in the oil and gas industry, uh, in my previous career, my previous life in the oil and gas industry, and to society in general. Uh, if we have a, a good way of predicting where these flow units occur, and likewise, conversely, where they don't occur, we can greatly reduce exploration risk. We can do a better job of exploring for new oil and gas fields. Uh, even in areas of existing fields where we already have known production there, we can do a better job, uh, we can improve the efficiency with which we extract oil and gas uh, from the subsurface. We can improve our abilities to characterize even known reservoirs. So enormous benefits can be, can be gained if we do a better job of, of understanding and predicting reservoir quality. So at this point, let's start zeroing in and talking about, you know, what actually controls reservoir quality? What, what drives it? In general terms, in sedimentary rocks, what we understand is that reservoir quality is controlled by a, a range of different uh, factors. Initially, it's controlled by a series of depositional controls. And to try to illustrate that, I, I wanted to show you this schematic block diagram of some idealized siliciclastic depositional environments. This diagram sort of shows on the west side of it here, it shows this sort of eroding hinterland that's the source of all the, the sedimentary grains, the sedimentary particles that you see in this picture. These grains are eroded, they're transported and deposited in a variety of different depositional environments across this picture from alluvial fans to, to fluvial systems of various types to beaches and shore face and offshore. At any rate, a range of different depositional environments, but each of these different depositional environments has its own uh, set of reservoir quality parameters. So depositional processes, depositional controls affect the reservoir, the initial reservoir quality uh, at the time of deposition. However, that's not the end of the story. After the sediment is deposited in a, very, a series of diagenetic processes become at play. So you have post-depositional modifications, and we've sort of lumped all those together and call them diagenesis. But these include a number of different processes. I've tried to sort of summarize perhaps one of the simplest of these, which is compaction. Uh, here you can see with greater and greater burial, uh, the sedimentary grains are forced closer and closer together to actually then reduce reservoir quality with increasing compaction. Diagenesis includes a whole range of processes, cementation, dissolution, pressure solution, uh, dolomitization, a whole range of different processes. But the point is diagenesis uh, alters, affects, impacts the original template, the original reservoir quality template that's established at the time of deposition to produce what it is you're actually looking at in the subsurface, final present day reservoir quality, porosity and permeability. So you have to understand all of these factors in order to really be able to take a stab at predict, understanding and predicting final reservoir quality. So in generic terms, that's how reservoir quality works in sedimentary systems, sedimentary rocks. 
thinking about this then in terms of carbonates. Well, carbonates are special. I, I've, I've labeled them here, they're peculiar rocks, but I mean that in a good way. Uh, they're distinctive in some amazing, amazing ways. Um, we could talk for weeks on this particular topic, the distinctiveness of carbonates, but I'll try to sort of summarize with a couple of key points here. One of the things that's distinctive about carbonates is their depositional settings and geometry. Um, Noel James uh, was writing several decades ago, and, and, and in one of his articles, he had this expression that really resonated with me. Carbonates are born and not made. And what does he mean by that? Well, instead of, uh, in the previous diagram we showed, that, which uh, uh, talked about clastic depositional environments, implicit within this whole diagram is this idea of erosion, transport, and deposition. In other words, where the, the sedimentary particles end up is not where they started from. In contrast, if we look at a modern carbonate depositional setting, and this is the, the modern Bahamia uh, modern Bahamas platform here. If you look at the, the different sedimentary environments that occur presently across the, the Bahamas platform, what you see is that all the sedimentary particles, all the grains here actually formed in place or close to where they finally ended up being deposited. So carbonates are intrabasinal in origin. They form basically where they're deposited. So this is a very different idea from being uh, eroded from some pre-existing hinterland and then transported into this basin. Carbonates are, are made in place. They're born and not, and not made, to, uh, to, be, to, be, to be honest there. And part of this is due to the reflection that many of the uh, carbonate uh, 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 sedimentary environments are highly dependent upon the activity of organisms. Um, and this is, this is true in a number of senses. Many of the sedimentary particles that you see, the, the sedimentary grains that you see in, in, in carbonate depositional environments are actually organic in origin, skeletal grains in origin, either through the breakdown of larger grains or, even, or, or through uh, microscopic uh, grains that are, that are actually living in this, in this, in this depositional setting. So organisms are implicit throughout carbonate depositional settings. Um, another thing to note about the importance of, of the activity of organisms or organic activity is that, as you can see here, this is a large coral in place. Carbonate depositional environments, because they're so often tied up to the activity of organisms, can actually build up and change the shape of their own depositional environment. So they can actually uh, control their own environment to a, to a certain extent. So they control the shape of, of the basin, to, to, to say it another way. So organisms are a key factor to, to understand the activity of organisms, organic activity is a key factor to understand this, these, this peculiarity, this difference in, 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 in carbonate sediments from uh, siliciclastics or other types of sedimentary rocks or sedimentary systems. So depositional settings and geometry is, is one distinctive aspect. Distinctive aspect. Another is that carbonates are much more susceptible to post-depositional or diagenetic alteration than our siliciclastics. Um, just to illustrate that for you, this is a, a photograph of a hard ground, uh, of, a, of a beach rock, if you will, uh, in the Bahamas again. And what you can see here is that this is fully a rock. You can see the guy, you can see his feet standing on it. This is a rock, even though it's a very, very young sediment. This may only be a couple of hundred years old. Um, there are actually documented uh, examples of hard grounds uh, basically that include, that have incorporated Coca-Cola cans in them. So post-depositional alteration, in this case, cementation, lithification of the, of the sediment occurs very quickly, almost from the time the, the, the sedimentary particles, the, the grains finally hit the, hit the sea floor, diagenesis begins. Interestingly enough, this is a, a photomicrograph, a thin section photomicrograph from this same uh, beach rock section here. Um, this is an oolitic beach rock, and you can see ooids as these nice ovoid grains present throughout here. But you can see just a little bit of cement. You see these white cements that are starting to fill up the pore space. Not a lot of porosity has been occluded by addition of these cements. There's really not very, it hasn't had much of an impact on destroying reservoir quality. It's starting to fill up uh, porosity. Porosity, again, remember, we've, injected these uh, thin sections, these samples with blue dyed epoxy. Uh, 
so anytime you see blue, that's porosity. So we've had a little bit of occlusion of porosity, not much, but what we've done is fully lithify this, this sediment. This guy is able to walk comfortably across there. It isn't collapsing as he's, as, he's, uh, as he's walking across this. So what this means is early lithification of the sediment can often prevent later compaction during later burial. So post-depositional alteration, diagenesis occurs very early, basically immediately upon deposition. It can extend throughout the life of the sediment, throughout burial to the present day. And with significant further diagenesis, the pore systems that form the, 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 the fabric of the rock is altered even further. This is another thin section photomicrograph of a neolithic sediment, but in this case, you've actually had all of the original interparticle porosity here filled up with cement. And the ooids, this is this was still this was originally an oolite, had largely been leached away. So you've actually formed a porosity inversion here, uh, where what was originally pore space, these interparticle pores around the ooids, has been filled up with cement and is now solid, whereas the, the grains themselves, the ooids themselves, have been leached out or are now pores. So you've inverted the pore system. Further diagenesis in other places can act differently where you, you actually preserve the inner particle pore space, but just remove the, uh, or just replace the, the grains themselves. So diagenesis can significantly alter the fabric of the rock. As a result, also, you can produce very complex pore networks. I think that's, that's pretty obvious. They're complex in terms of both their size and shape, uh, but also in terms of their time of formation. Pore systems in carbonates can actually uh, be formed before the sediment actually is, 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 is deposited. And here's an example to show this. This is a, a sedimentary particle in a, in a modern carbonate sediment that is a fragment of a coral. And you see all of these pores here. These were actually original intraskeletal pores within the coral as it was growing, as it was living on the seafloor. So these pores actually formed before the sediment was deposited. But as we said, diagenesis can sit, can, you know, continues all the way through, in, in most cases, through the life of the, of the rock. You can have extensive cementation. Um, you can have dissolution. These are some large uh, 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 moldy pores here where some original grain has been dissolved away. You can see this large bivalve here is partially, partially uh, uh, dissolved away. Um, so this is a, a fabric that's been extensively altered and reservoir quality has been significantly degraded in that case. Um, diagenesis can also uh, create mammoth pores. So pores of a wide uh, variety of scales. And that's what's shown in this photograph on the right here. This is a large leached pore, a large cavern, if you will, that was formed when the platform top was exposed and you formed these sinkholes and then they're covered over with, uh, once the, the platform top is reflooded, they're, they're, they're covered over, over by the sea again. So just look at the scale of that. Note the sizes of these fishing boats on top of it. These are huge pores that penetrate for perhaps 100 meters uh, into, the, into the platform. So very complex pore networks can be formed as a, as a result of, of diagenesis. And just to kind of close this section and perhaps to give you kind of overall the bad news, if you will. <laughs> um, most recent carbonate sediments, I think you've gotten a feel for this already, start out life as really porous entities. Uh, measuring measurements of, of porosity in recent carbonate depositional settings are excruciatingly high, 40 to 75% porosity in, 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 in most cases. So, Carbonate sediments start out life as really excellent reservoirs, if you will, but then once they're buried, diagenesis then shifts this whole curve uh, to, the, to the left. And in fact, by the time, uh, in most cases, by the time we get to the end of diagenesis, most ancient carbonate rocks have very little porosity, 5% or less is, is typical. It's only in a few cases where, if you will, diagenesis has essentially been been retarded a bit. It's, it's been inhibited for some reason that you actually preserve some porosity, uh, preserve some good reservoir quality to produce a carbonate reservoir rock. So this is our challenge as carbonate reservoir geologists is to try to understand and predict where these sort of anomalous occurrences are uh, and, and try, to, try to do a better job of, of guiding our activities in that direction.
So that's kind of the overview, if you will, talking about reservoir quality, what are the main drivers for it in general terms, talking about carbanes, how they're distinctive. Now I wanted to talk about some specific applications, some specific case studies about how we used our understanding of, 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 of reservoir quality and carbonates to kind of get a better idea of uh, a reservoir's producibility, if you will. And there's three main themes I'll try to hit repeatedly as I go through these case histories. Um, if you remember nothing else from the talk today, I hope you remember these, these three points. First, carbonate rocks are heterogeneous. That shouldn't be a, a news flash. I, I think you've gotten a sense from that already from the, the, the photomicrographs I've shown so far. Secondly, this heterogeneity results from the effects of both depositional factors, both stratigraphic and facies, and diagenesis. And then finally, deposition and diagenesis often work congruently. In other words, they work hand in hand in that diagenesis often follows a template established at the time of deposition. I have seen this, this probably isn't universally true, but I've seen this lesson over and over again in, in, in many, many reservoirs in the Middle East. This seems to be a, a fairly common template. So I wanted to leave that with you as sort of a main theme from this talk. So we'll use two examples to try to illustrate that. Both of them are from uh, the Middle East. The first is an Upper Cretaceous example from, from, from Iraq, and the second is an Upper Jurassic uh, example from Saudi Arabia. So let's look first at the Upper Cretaceous. Uh, the case history I'd like to share with you is of the, the Mishraf Reservoir, which is the most important carbonate reservoir in Iraq. Uh, it's, been, it's been said that roughly 30% of Iraq's reserves occur in Mishraf carbonate reservoirs. Specifically, the, the, the learnings I wanted to share with you today are from a study that I did a couple of years ago on a field, we'll call it the H field, located in southeastern Iraq in the Mesopotamian basin here, uh, just a few miles uh, uh, north west of the, the, the head, if you will, of the Arabian Gulf. And we'll try to set the scene for this. As I said, this is a, a late Cretaceous reservoir, the Mishraf Formation. Um, this shows what the world looked like. What was the global setting at the time of deposition of this particular reservoir? This is during the late Cretaceous. The location of the, the study area we did is shown here. And what you can see is that it occurs on a broad shallow shelf that sort of rimmed the northeastern margin, if you will, of, of the African plate at that time. The, the Red Sea Rift hadn't opened by then, so this was all one big happy plate, so to speak. Uh, but we, uh, we were looking at a, at, a, at a setting then that was maybe a few degrees north of the equator, so it's equatorial, it's warm, it's tropical, uh, it's very humid, the climate's very humid at that time. But overall, we're looking at something that formed on a, on a broad, shallow platform here on the, on the northeastern side of that, that plate. Zooming in a little bit, this is a paleogeographic map that was created by well, some, of the, some of the regional workers in the area. And that was a, a thing of beauty, something that we, we were fortunate, we were blessed to have access to. Some of the regional work had done quite a good job of describing the range of, of sedimentary environments and even diagenesis that occurred overall. Uh, the field we're looking at is shown here, um, but at any rate, the, the overall paleogeographic setting was one where you had sort of a, an intra-shelf basin to the west, an intra-shelf basin, so it's not an abyssal depth, but it is deeper than environments to the east. So an intra-shelf basin that moves eastward into a rim platform, rimmed by these sort of green rocks here, which are rudus biostrom and shoal facies, and then moving further to east into a sort of a platform interior and inboard location that's dominated by back shoal and lagoonal facies. So that's kind of the overall setting. This, this field that we were looking at, as you can see, is kind of in the transition between platform interior, platform margin, and intra-shell basin. So we should see a lot of interesting things going on. There should be a lot of action uh, in this field. So that was kind of the initial, the initial assessment of, 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 of the sorts of facies and so forth that we should see here. Again, we're talking about the Mishraf Reservoir. It's a late Cretaceous, Sidomanian, and lower Turonian in age. Again, this is the most important reservoir in Iraq, carbonate reservoir in Iraq. The key learning, so I'll try to give you the headlines for this, this study 
and then then give you the the data that we use to build these learnings. But the key learnings from this were that depositional factors, and this starts out fundamentally with depositional texture, depositional facies, and then stratigraphic framework drive initial reservoir quality. Depositional fa factors drive initial reservoir quality, and then diagenesis later modifies this initial reservoir quality, sometimes dramatically, but at certain specific reservoir intervals. So that was kind of the big takeaway, if you will. Let's talk now about how we came to those conclusions. Talk first about depositional factors. What's, what's driving reservoir quality, at least initial reservoir quality in this field? Again, we had quite a good uh, regional picture uh, background to sort of uh, build upon for our specific field. The regional picture is a very nice one. Uh, this is, uh, again, work done by Tom Ramadi and, and, and his colleagues. Uh, but it, in, in, in the regional picture, the overall assessment of the Mishraf formation as a whole, the Mishraf Reservoir, was that it's consists it's comprised of two large scale third order shoaling upward sequences. So two sequences that go from the Romela formation below shoaling upward, and then you reach a mis a, a discontinuity, a, a, a sequence boundary, if you will, and then you you you, you move into a second uh, large scale third order cycle that again is really shoaling upward to a major unconformity at the top. Uh, that separates the Mishra from the Overlay Kassif formation. Now, how does this work in, in, in details, at least in the, in the details in this picture? Well, what you can see is that the showing upper sequels, sequences here that you see start typically with fairly deep water sediments. And if you look, the codes are, are, are kind of explained on the, uh, on the, the, the geologic model, the, the, the conceptual geologic uh, framework uh, model to the right. Uh, but these sort of dark purple, dark blue uh, represent deep marine wacky stones and even mudstones in places that then show upward to shallow open marine pack stones and even mudling pack stones and then are capped by uh, grain stones, by uh, rudus biostrome and shoal grain stones. So that's kind of the, the first big sequence that they have. And then the second big sequence is quite a bit more complicated, but it's also sort of represents a shoaling upward succession where you kind of repeat the or, or proceed further along this this model, uh, starting a little bit in, in deep marine um, wacky stones and mudstones, and then you move up quickly through shallow marine pack stones, local grain stones and biostrome, uh, rudest biostromes, up finally into significant amounts of, of back shoal lagoon and ultimately tidal flats at the top. And they've, they've used that succession, that vertical succession of facies to construct the geologic model that you see here on the right, uh, the, these facies associations that they've constructed. And it is a really nice, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasing model, if you will, uh, going from sort of these deeper water facies, deep marine wacky stones and mudstones up into shallow open marine shoal facies, sort of rimming the platform, if you will, uh, going from the, the intra-shell basin up to the platform margin, the, the platform rimming facies, and then into the interior back shoal lagoon and finally tidal flat. Okay, well that was sort of the, uh, the overall picture that we, that we had when we started. And it's, it's very nice. However, once we started looking at the rocks, and that's where we started in this facies, we started with the rocks. Uh, we found the situation was was quite a bit more complicated than we'd initially uh, assumed it would be or thought it would be. Um, this is a key well uh, from our field, and it's quite a busy diagram. I apologize for that. I'll try to draw your attention to the key parameters that I, that I wanted to highlight for you. Rather than those two sort of major third order sequences, when we started looking at the rocks, the stacking patterns that we saw in the rocks and how they related to field performance, we came up with a little bit of a different look. In fact, we were able to recognize six major sequences and they're labeled here uh, from the bottom to the top, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and what they show are generally sort of showing up or typically fairly regressive dominated showing upward sequences. Now, you can kind of break the formation apart in the middle here. And this appears to correspond to the middle Cinnamanian to the late Cinnamanian boundary. But the sequences that we saw below, that is sequence A, B, C, and D, all seem to be fairly well-organized sequences where they started out 
pretty much every one of them started out with deep marine wacky stones and shoaled up through shallow marine pack stones up into shoal and biostrome uh, grain stones. And you see that repeatedly, sequence A, sequence B, sequence C, and sequence D is, is, is really the one where you have the thickest development of this, of this nice uh, shoal facies that you see here in this sort of light green. Now above sequence D, above SBD, things seem to change significantly. Instead of these nice well-ordered sequences where you seem to have the complete succession of facies from deep marine to uh, even at times tidal flats through, through the, those sequences. Instead, they seem to be very different and, and sort of shortened in a way. And I'll explain that in a second. And that while you do have local um, shallow marine, shoal, and rudus biostrom, mostly they seem to be dominated by back shoal, by lagoon, and even at the top a very thick uh, tidal flat cap. So this upper part is much more heterogeneous. It seems to be stuck, if you will, in these, these, these much more shallow water, these more sort of platform interior facies uh, that, we, uh, that, that the work previously had interpreted uh, would, would occur there. So a very different set of cycles above or, or set of sequences above from below. And what we did interpret this is that this represents a fundamental change in accommodation where the uh, sequences that develop below this SBD, uh, this top of the, the D sequence, if you will, there was ample accommodation. So every time you expose the surface and then flooded, you, were, you flooded amply, you were able to deposit deep marine sediments, and then you uh, were able to provide continuing accommodation such that you were able to go through the full uh, sequence, if you will, of, 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 of the full shoaling upward sequence until you got at least to shoal and sometimes into uh, tidal flat. So this is an area where there was ample accommodation. Once you get to the top, though, it seems like there's just not much space to store additional sediment. So a very limited uh, set of accommodation. Uh, accommodation space is, is pretty limited up in there. Now that's kind of the overall picture in terms of uh, the facies that we saw and how they stack, how they build to create these six sequences that we recognize. One word here about reservoir quality, though, uh, if you look at the uh, sort of the, the, the third uh, wireline curve from the, from the, from the right, uh, you'll see a, a curve that's labeled porosity. This is phi, this is porosity. What you can see is that porosity is increasing from left to right. What you can see is that the highest porosity clearly relates to where these shoal facies occur. You can see that repeatedly throughout here. So right off the bat, you can see the shoal biostrome, uh, rudus biostrome and shoal grain stones represent the best quality reservoir rocks uh, in, in the whole reservoir here. You can see that pretty, pretty well described. So we're already starting to get an idea that depositional texture, depositional facies plays a fundamental role in, in driving reservoir quality in this, in this particular reservoir. And this is the, the picture in one well. So this is a, a 1D uh, uh, cycle stacking uh, picture, if you will, based on both core image log and wireline data in this well. We next wanted to go 2D and we started looking at cross sections across the field. And this shows a, a one of those cross sections. And basically it kind of shows the same thing where all of the sequences below the top of sequence D, in other words, below SBD, are these nice, well-developed, um, uh, you know, ample accommodations, these nice, well-organized sequences where you go from deep marine uh, up into shoal and, and locally tidal flat capped uh, all the way through up to the top of, of sequence D. Above sequence D, things change. It's much more dominated by back shoal and, uh, and lagoonal facies and finally thick thick tidal flats at the top. One thing that's obvious once you see this, and let me just go to the next one here. So this is the data. Let me just go to the schematic. And if I take the data away and just try to color in the facies so you can see how they are. One thing that's obvious is below this SBD, uh, the, the, the top of sequence D, the, the continuity, the correlative, the correlate, the correlatability, I just made that word up. Anyway, the correlatability of facies in the lower half of the reservoir is really pretty high. 
uh, these spaces extend quite a long way. So there's lots of continuity to these reservoir units. And remember this sort of light green color that you see here, so, so predominant in the lower part of this, uh, this picture. These are those shoal grain stones. So these are the high reservoir quality units here uh, that, that, that occur in that part of the succession. So high correlative, highly correlative sequences below. Above, though, it's much more discontinuous. Highly, highly, it's very difficult to correlate <laughs> in this upper succession. And again, we attributed this to the differences in accommodation. Lots of accommodation space, so you build these nice, well-organized sequences below, low accommodation above. So you're really trying to struggle to put sediment wherever you can. There's, there's, there's not much space to, to deposit material at that point. So just to kind of emphasize that style difference, that stratigraphic style difference, if you will, uh, the lower part, high accommodation, almost a layer cake, if you can use that term in, in carbonates, but, but high degree of continuity, very low degree of continuity above, much more difficult to correlate. So we've seen already how depositional factors, depositional texture, depositional facies, and then stratigraphic framework really drive initial reservoir quality, but then diagenesis really modifies this initial, this initial picture. Now, just to say a few words in general about diagenesis in this particular field, in this particular formation, as we said before, diagenesis typically occurs, and that's the case here, throughout the history of the rock from deposition to present day. So it is still ongoing to a certain extent today. In this particular succession, Diagenesis most significantly, the thing that affects reservoir properties most significantly is related to subaerial exposure at sequence boundaries. The idea here is that the sequence boundaries represent exposures of the platform top. Uh, and remember we're in a humid climate, so you had lots of rain that was falling. So meteoric fluids are able to access the platform top. Initially, these are undersaturated with respect to calcium carbonate. So initially they leach the carbonates, but then as the fluids reach, you know, begin to approach saturation and then they start to precipitate uh, calcium carbonate as cements. So this is kind of the interesting thing about this whole process is that the movement of these fluids from the sequence boundaries down can both be responsible for leaching and for cementation. Um, there's, a, there's a whole lot more that could be said about this, but collectively we'll just call these processes and products karst. Um, and just, just to kind of demonstrate how that works at, at the H field, at, at our particular field, if we start out using the uh, nice schematic geologic model that was provided to us by the regional workers, these are marine sediments, they're all deposited below sea level, some of them in deeper water, some of them in very shallow water, but all of them were typically deposited below sea level. You cross the sequence boundary, you expose the platform top, what happens? You get rainfall. You get development of, 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 uh, of aquifers that are capable of leaching and then uh, precipitation of cements. So once the, the, so as a result, you form these karstic zones, these zones of diagenetic alteration that sort of rim these sequence boundaries tops, sequence boundary tops. Now the degree of alteration, the degree of karsting varies. Uh, across the area. If you're in an area that perhaps was depositional higher and so it was exposed for longer periods of time to meteoric diagenesis, you can have a much bigger impact, a much bigger meteoric footprint uh, from that period of exposure. So you can get things like karstic brecciation and infiltration of fines into the underlying sediment there. So it can actually degrade significantly reservoir quality in some areas. In other areas where perhaps the the meteoric impact was lighter, the footprint was not quite as pronounced. You could have maybe a little bit of cementation, but lots of leaching. So you can form these nice big uh, molding pores, these nice flow zones that can be also sort of parallel to these sequence boundary tops. So think about then, let's put that together. That may be one sequence boundary where sea level fell and then rose again. Uh, we recognized at least six in this, in this reservoir. Um, and we see those here, these sequence boundaries. If we sort of color in where we saw karsting occur, and you can see how it would be, these could be significant intraformational issues. Intraformational, in other words, they affect uh, 
reservoir performance, fluid flow in the reservoir internally within the reservoir. So they can both serve as reservoir boundaries if they essentially uh, cemented or, or karstified the reservoir and reduced reservoir quality, but they can also at times form high flow zones uh, if they just primarily uh, uh, serve to leach and maybe do a little bit of cementation, but, but enhance the properties of the reservoir. So these, these sequence boundary, boundary related karstic zone, karsted zones, these, the, 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 the diagenesis associated with these sequence boundaries is a key factor in understanding reservoir quality and fluid flow in this reservoir. And just to give you a little bit of detail and then we'll move on to the second case history. Um, this is a sort of a conventional uh, porosity permeability plot uh, porosity in an arithmetic scale, uh, log, log uh, permeability on the, on the y-axis, porosity on the x, uh, log permeability on the y. What you can see here is I've sorted by depositional texture, which you see, as we've said is, can be directly related to facies in most cases. And what you'd see is that the grain stones uh, actually plot out here, these dark blue. So they have the best reservoir quality, often approaching Darcy, you know, hundreds of millidarcies of permeability uh, and good porosity as well. The pack stones have quite a bit more mud and they are these sort of light blue plots that have a range of, of, of reservoir quality parameters, porosity and permeability, but generally lower than the grain stones. The wacky stones typically are lower still and finally the mud stones are the worst of all. So what we'd say is understanding how depositional texture and depositional facies play in this reservoir is key to understanding what controls reservoir quality in, in, in the reservoir. So that's depositional facies, depositional texture. I'd say also diagenesis, uh, again, as organized along the stratigraphic framework that we built for this reservoir is important in terms of establishing both boundaries and, and, and high flow zones. And I, I wanted to sort of show you some of the, the data integration that we did in this, in this study where we looked at some engineering data to try to get a, an idea of where the high flow zones are and where the, the reservoir boundaries are. Um, the plot on the right, um, sorry, on the left, <laughs> is a flow meter plot. Uh, this is a, 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 a plot that shows <clears throat> that shows the entry of fluids into the borehole. What you can see is at the bottom of the borehole around 3,018 or so meters, um, you see initially you have some, some good fluid entry and the green represents oil, the blue is water, so it's mostly oil that's coming in. And then it kind of stabilizes up until about 3,000 meters or so. And then from 3,000 meters to 2,980 meters or so, you have a dramatic increase in oil entry into the borehole. So you have a lot of the oil coming into the reservoir comes in from this 20 meter thick interval here. And then from there on up, basically there's not much additional or incremental oil that comes in here. Well, so if we look at this, we can see that this is actually bounded uh, by one of our sequence boundaries. So this, the, this, this high flow zone, this high fluid entry zone representing probably what 70% of the of the fluid that's being produced in this well bore is all coming in from about a 20 meter interval just below the sequence boundary. This, when we took a look at it, this is uh, one of these, these karsted leach zones, high flow zones that occurred just below one of the sequence boundaries. Well, at the same time, so that's an example of leaching, at the same time, cementation uh, can occur at these sequence boundaries and can, and, and can form reservoir boundaries, if you will, or at least reservoir baffles. And we looked for this, we looked at MDT data. Now, MDT is a tool that measures uh, reservoir pressure. And so what you would do is you'd measure pressure and you'd note pressure differences as you're uh, measuring pressure across, uh, as you move up the borehole. And so where those pressure differences occur, you could say, well, if you see a change in pressure, then that indicates there's some sort of baffle. The compartment below isn't fully uh, in pressure communication with the compartment above. When we started flagging those baffles, those pressure baffles, we ended up seeing that, well, in most cases, these occur along some of our sequence boundaries. Now these are different sequence boundaries from this one, but this is one where the bad effects, if you will, of uh, of karsting of diagenesis occurred where we've created baffles or barriers to, to flow here. You can see even below there's, there's some of these boundaries below are uh, form 
in this case, not quite as continuous, but, but forms some baffles as well. So these are cases where we can see diagenesis associated with their sequence boundaries are responsible both for leaching to give you high flow zones and cementation to give you reservoir boundaries uh, in the reservoir. So I hope that is clear and, and makes sense in terms of underlying reservoir quality. Hit on today, carbonates are heterogeneous. Uh, this heterogeneity is driven by both depositional and diagenetic factors. And then often these two processes, these two, these two aspects work together, work congruently to produce uh, the final reservoir quality that you see in the rock. I hope that's made sense to you uh, and that I've convinced you of those arguments from the data that I've shown you. Hopefully this will take some of the magic, if you will, out of reservoir quality prediction and carbonates for you as you move forward in your future career. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any questions? I'll be happy to try to do my best to answer them. Uh, thank you, Dave, for an amazing sharing on this course. So the next session is Q&A session. So if you have any question, you can click the raise hand or sticker option, and I will let you to turn on your audio. Mm, any question? Any questions or, or even any comments? I, I understand there may be some professionals in the audience. Uh, you know, I'd be interested to hear how these thoughts uh, match up with your experience as well. It'd be good to get a conversation going along that line. Uh, to Mr. Ahmad Yuski, you can ask your question. Hello, Dave. Hey, Ahmed. Uh, what a nice and insightful presentation. Thank you for your presentation. My, uh, my question is uh, about the diagenetic controls for the carbonate reservoir quality. So you mentioned before in your presentation that the diagenetic factors, uh, spe especially the meteoric water, can give a good effect or bad effect for the carbonate reservoir quality, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, could we predict the diagenesis effect, especially the meteoric water, whether is it going to give a good or bad effect in the uh, carbonate uh, formation? And is there any correlation to the carbonate platform that exposed and affected by the meteoric water itself? So that's so, my question. So, okay, let, let, me, let me try to answer that and then I'll come back to you because I'm not sure I caught the last part of your question. Just in general, when you start looking at a reservoir, you know, start big and then zoom in. Uh, is, is, is the advice I would give. So the big picture, you know, you want to start thinking about what climate, what was the, 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 the paleogeography like at the time of deposition? The first example I showed you from a rock, it was clear your, the world was very different than from in the, the early example in the Jurassic. Uh, it was a humid climate, so with humidity, you expect rainfall, so you expect abundant meteoric diagenesis. Um, so that's a first control. The Jurassic example, there's hardly any, it's, it's a very arid climate, very different world at that point, uh, at least those, where those sediments were deposited. Um, so without, with aridity, I mean, think about modern day Saudi Arabia, how often does it rain there? It's not very often. Uh, so, so if there's not much rainfall around, because of the arid climate, then you're probably not going to have much of a meteoric footprint, not much meteoric alteration uh, to the to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the to the rocks as a result. Now, zooming in further, say you do have a lot of meteoric input, you do have a lot of uh, meteoric diagenesis. The thing to look at there now is where would that where would that diagenesis be localized in the rocky example? Uh, it's associated with the sequence boundaries. That's, those are the exposure surfaces. Those are areas of severe exposure. Uh, so think about, again, modern day Bahamas. You know, a lot of that's in an era, sorry, is in a human climate. So you get these nice, nicely developed uh, uh, aquifers, you know, these freshwater lenses that are developed. So diagenesis, meteoric diagenesis is sort of localized or focused uh, along those surfaces. Um, so it will continue further on down, but 
in, in my experience, at any rate, you can almost you can almost plot that as a decreasing impact as you move away from that uh, from that severe exposure surface. And the reason is because initially, when the rain hits the ground, it's highly undersaturated with respect to calcium carbonate. So initially, it dissolves, but then as it dissolves the carbonate, it starts to incorporate that material into solution. And after a while, it reaches saturation and then starts precipitating. So after a while, it equilibrates with the rocks around it, if you want to think about it. So most pronounced at the surface, decreasing downward, just in general terms. Does that answer your question, Ahmed? I, I'm not sure I caught all of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so besides, we have to know the paleogeography, but we also have to know the paleoclimate for Perfect. when the uh, rocks depo deposit, right? Absolutely. Perfect, yes. Okay, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, so, any other question? Oh, uh, to Mr. Zulfikar Montazeri, you can ask your question now. Uh, is my voice clear? Your yeah. voice is clear. Could, could okay, you turn okay. on your camera? Could you turn on your camera? Uh, wait, wait a second. Perfect. Ah, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Dave, for the pre amazing pre presentation. It really enlightened me about the carbonate reservoir. Uh, I have a, one question, and it's, um, as you mentioned before, that carbonate are heterogeneous. I mean, it could differ by maybe the deposi depositional settings and geometry. And my question is, uh, we often talk the porosity in maybe in a mi microscopic scale, uh, such, such as twin section or uh, maybe gases or fractures. And my question is, how about the um, larger scale geometry such as maybe you mentioned before the caves, the cost caves, or maybe carbonate caves, uh, subsurface caves that maybe have a massive porosity or we could say holes. Is it possible for the caves to maybe be a reservoir or maybe uh, mm -hmm. contains hydrocarbon so that it could be a uh, oil or gas reservoir. Absolutely, absolutely. Paleo caves are often, can often be quite good reservoirs. Uh, let me just look at something. I had a slide talking about carbs here and I took it out. Um, can I, let me just share my screen again if, if I could. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. This is some work done by uh, uh, Peter Smart and Fiona Whitaker at, at the University of Bristol, looking at caves systems. And these are, you know, these are ancient caves. They're not hydrocarbon reservoirs. They're actually caves at the surface, but it does sort of illustrate the complexity. Karst is very complex and often the caves themselves can be, or often, often good reservoirs themselves. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second, but the point here is that karst can be very complicated. It can be sourced from multiple horizons. So you can have karst associated with, with this horizon. You can also have karst associated with an earlier horizon. So you have multiple generations of karst. Uh, they, can, they, can, they can also be sourced from one horizon, but have multiple levels. You know, you can have a, uh, a stream that dives in and then jumps uh, at different levels. Uh, they can also be sort of problematic in that uh, they can often follow a certain passageway but then leave the intervening rocks virtually untouched, uh, which can be a, a function of the original uh, sedimentary fabric of, of, that, of that rock. So cars can be quite complicated. And yes, these reservoirs, these passages, these uh, caves can be reservoirs themselves. Often with burial, they can be collapsed, which you think that's that's not a good thing. But what happens? What typically happens is even when they're when they've collapsed, what they do is they form this zone of brecciation, uh, where you get lots of nice porosity that's connected up because they were all originally connected up along a a, a cave passage, if you will. 
Um, okay, so I don't know if that helps or not, but the answer is yes. Uh, you know, karsting can occur at multiple levels, uh, and, and, and the caves themselves can be quite important reservoirs. We saw this in West Texas quite frequently. Um, I'm just trying to think. I, I, uh, you know, in Kazakhstan, I know they're produ produ producing from some karstic reservoirs as well. At any rate, there are multiple points, places, or multiple examples you can point to where karst, where caves, caverns uh, can be important reservoirs. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that answers clearly. And I think I have a little bit one more question. Do sure. they need maybe maybe properties like major reservoir like Cape Rock or Seal to contain the um, the hydrocarbon on the caves? Yeah, I mean that's that's often the the difficulty there is 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 finding you know what's what's the seal for for a hydrocarbon you know cave for a, a hydrocarbon system in a cave. Um, you you, you kind of have to rely on something over the overlying that 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 karsted succession to give you a cap. Uh, in in our case, karsting itself, you know, you get in these brecciated intervals. Um, I don't know if you recall the photo I showed. These brecciated intervals with sort of infiltrated silts, um, they can be quite effective seals, if you will, overlying a karsted interval. Does that, does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, okay. I think that's really answering my question. Thank you very much, Mr. Thanks. Dave. There's, there's so much more we could talk about on that, that regard. I mean, you know, karst in itself is a fascinating subject and then karst reservoirs, uh, it's, 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 it's huge. So more could be said. <laughs> yeah. I'll be looking forward for that. Thanks. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Day, for answering the question. Uh, is there any other question? Any other question? Uh, so, I think there is no more question. Uh, so, we are now on the very end of today's course. On behalf of the organizing commits, we would like to apologize for any mistakes throughout today's course. Thank you, Dave, for sharing your experience and thank you to all of you who has joined this course. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank yeah, you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Dave. Okay. Have a good bye -bye. sleep. Thank you, Dave. Okay, thanks, thanks. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Dave. Have a nice evening, Dave. <laughs> thanks. Looking forward for another course, of course. <laughs> okay. My pleasure. Take care, guys.